beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, well, continue with our hymn of the month, uh, Psalm 146 to the tune of Come Thou Fast. <laughs> He will always render justice for the sake of those oppressed. He gives food to those who hunger, satisfies their emptiness. God releases all the prisoners to the Bible memory work, which is together with the table of duties. So, of simple government, and then we'll say the Bible together. For, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad, which you have no fear of the one who is in authority. Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Romans 13, 3 and 4. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Luther's morning prayer, I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life would please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, taking the kids off to Sunday school. And... <coughs> As far as the hymn goes, I don't have too much more to say about it than we've already said on um, singing the songs and uh, the text and everything. I think it's a beloved tune. Uh, we have another psalm uh, to a hymn tune to today. We have Psalm 119, 9 to 16. So Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible, and if you Look up Psalm 119 in your Bible. You don't have to right now. It's a uh, acrostic poem where each line of each uh, section begins with a different Hebrew letter, and it goes in order of the Hebrew alphabet. So each section is a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And um, the 9th through 16 is the section. It's just one section of that psalm and it's the second section it's the so there's aleph is the first hebrew letter uh for verses one to eight and then nine through sixteen is bait is the hebrew letter and so um we have that that those verses for our psalm today in church 
uh, later on, if you look ahead in your bulletin, and we're singing it to the tune of Just As I Am Without One Plea. Just as I am without one plea. Um, pretty familiar tune to the congregation. I actually never really knew that hymn before I came really? here. Really? Yeah, I know. I know a lot of hymns. That's a sad, I sad of him. Never really sang that one yet. For whatever reason, just... Um, I think that's true for most people is that... Uh, this is a complete side note, but... I think most people, you know, have whatever their church's favorite hymns are that they grew up with, and even if people kind of change churches yeah. throughout time, there's still probably hymns here or there that kind of get missed in a person's life, you know, just for whatever reason, they end up not singing that much, so that's kind of one for me. Um, I've, I've sang a lot of hymns. Uh, I had the advantage of going to uh, LCMS college and then LCMS seminary that had chapel daily, where we sang out of the hymnal every day, so... Um, and we also sing, since we've had, you know, kids, we, we sing with our family most uh, nights for devotion. So, um, I know most of the hymns in the LSB, but that was one that was always kind of unfamiliar to me. Mm. But now I know it because it's That's good. it's popular here. So. <laughs> Which, by the way, it proves to you, just so, if anyone ever accuses, oh, pastor only picks the hymns he likes and knows. That's not true. I pick off a list <laughs> of, uh, I have a database set up of what I know has been sung before and, so on and so forth. So I don't just pick the ones I know. Um, but I know that tune is familiar to y'all, so. That's a, that's a popular hymn in the Baptist church. It is, yeah. It's a, yeah. I, so, um, yeah, I know it's a kind of old American Baptist hymn. I just, you know, never really sang it much. So. Um, and I knew it was in our hymnal. I just never sang it much. Anyhow, so we're doing that today. So um, that, that should be good. I had, um, I did realize on the, Come that fact, there's a couple places where a couple of uh, dashes in the text would have been helpful. Um, like on, oh how blessed the one whose hope upon the Lord has got to stay. That the way the music lines up with the text there is a little awkward. So uh, like a, some dashes there to show where the changes in notes are would have been helpful. I had Rebecca go through the Psalm 119 to see if I should have put any dashes in there and she said that it was fine. So. Hopefully it's easy enough to follow um, and with, the, with the tune. That's but, next month. What's that? That's next month. No, that's the day in church. Yeah. So my plan for now, if everyone likes this, if, if everyone comes to me and says I hate singing psalms to hymn tunes, then I'll reconsider. Uh, so let me know if you hate it. But if... <laughs> as long as we stay away from the show time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, my plan is to kind of go every other week for a little bit with this and see how see how it goes. Um, I really like it. I love singing songs. I think it's good to memorize songs, and I think doing it to hymn tunes is by far, in a way, the easiest way to do it. So, um, anyway, just let me know if you hate it. But and if you if you love it, let me know. If you're indifferent, then you're indifferent. So you don't have to tell me anything. Um, all right. Chad loves it. All right. There we go. One vote for love. All right. Uh, what's the next? Oh, of simple government. So the catechism today is a continuation of last week where we had Romans 13, 1 to 2. So in the table of duties, Luther includes the first six verses of Romans 13 here on civil government. And... Um, so if you memorize two verses each week, which is very doable, then you have a whole passage of six verses memorized in three weeks. Um, the thing to note about verses 3 and 4 in Romans 13 is that when Paul gives this exhortation to, to the obedience of civil government, so, I mean, Romans 13 is, to be fair, an exhortation to the citizen uh, for the obedience of civil government, uh, by and large. Now, Luther is actually applying this to the civil government. He's saying this is what the government should be thinking about uh, when, it's, when it's carrying out its task. Now, Paul frames everything positively. He says, government's given by God. This is what government does. This is why, and, and so you should obey it because, because of these things. Now, this is not where Paul 
talks about what if the government's not doing these things, right? You have to go other places in the Bible for that. Scripture interprets scripture. So there, there are times, obviously, when the government doesn't do what it's supposed to, and we look to places like, uh, you know, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, the Egyptian midwives, uh, Jonathan and Saul. Um, you, there's a lot of places in the Bible where you can look at when government doesn't do its job and then how civil disobedience is carried out in a Christian way. However, uh, that's not really the case in Romans 13. But in Romans 13, what is interesting is that Paul does kind of have that implicit understanding of that the government is supposed to act a certain way, right? And that the basis of your obedience to the government is that they're doing certain things. And so what, what are these things? What is... What is it when a government is doing what it's supposed to versus when it's not supposed to doing what it's supposed to? He just, Paul just says here, well, they do this, right? Well, a good government does. <laughs> There's a civil disobeyer right there. Um, if I've ever seen one. All right. Uh, so what are these, what is the thing that the government's supposed to do? Okay, for the rulers are a terror to are not a terror to good conduct. You, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. Okay, so the first thing is that the government uh, promotes good. Promotes good. And obviously, if Paul is, this is the Bible, right? So what is what is good? Well, it's what's according to God's will and Holy Scripture. Uh, and you do what is good and you will receive his approval. Uh, but if you do what is wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Okay, so he promotes good and carries out God's wrath. On the wrong. The way that I, the, the phraseology I normally use to summarize this is promotes peace, punishes wickedness. Promotes peace, punishes wickedness. That's the government's main job. The government's main job is to give incentive and to promote that which is peaceful and right and good in a society, um, ideally according to the Bible according to God's word, right? I mean, a Christian government is the best government because God created the world and it's supposed to work according to his design, which we receive the clearest description of that in the Bible. But even if you have a government that's not explicitly Christian, um, according to God's creation, natural law, right? And God uh, institutes government so that his wrath can be carried out on the wrongdoer because, as I've said this before when we've had these discussions, the wrongdoer is not going to come to church and listen to me tell him to repent from the pulpit, right? The, the unbeliever is not going to just say, oh yeah, that, I totally agree, pastor, I should stop stealing. Uh, that's just not going to happen, right? And so God institutes government so that there will be a way to stop uh, chaos in the society on the basis of unbelievers who are wrongdoers. And so uh, this is the reason the government exists. And so the, the reason I'm going into this is because um, oftentimes Romans 13 will get quoted by those in the church as this kind of, oh, just got to do whatever the government says. That's what the Bible says. Paul says, do whatever the government says. Well, that's a kind of uncritical way to think about uh, what Paul is saying here. Because Paul is implicitly saying, he's implying, that there's a certain way the government is supposed to act. Right? There's not, it's not as if uh, every government throughout all of history is perfect, according to Romans 13. 
he's saying it, he's giving an ideal, right? He's saying ideally you should obey the government and ideally the government's going to be doing this and that all works really well. We obviously are going to have to ask ourselves at different times in history, uh, is the government actually doing this and what does that mean for our obedience to the government, right? So um, another thing I would also add just really quickly about that is that in America, specifically, the government that is given for us to obey, the government that is instituted by God in this country, um, the way the government's been designed uh, here, and I would say, you know, according to Paul, the hand of God is involved in the design of any government, really, um, is a government by the people for the people. And the governing, uh, the governing authority is not a person, a governor, uh, or an emperor, as it was in Paul's context. The governing authority in America is a document, right? The Constitution now, and then that also goes down to the local and state levels as well. Um, and so another thing to think about when it comes up to this question of governmental obedience in our context is just because the governor says something or just because the president says something or just because the Supreme Court says something or whatever, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that obeying the government means obeying, you know, whatever they say, right? Obeying the government in our context means uh, holding fast to the Constitution. And, you know, the, our Constitution is actually very explicit that civil disobedience is actually called for sometimes in the case of tyrannical governments. So, uh, or you can think about like the military's uh, enlistment oath that uh, Richard, were you in the military? Gary, you were. Um, oh. uh, that you swear to defend the country against enemies, foreign, foreign and, and domestic. Right. 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 And so uh, the idea of obeying the government in America, this is another thing we have to think about, is uh, that might be actually disobeying certain people that are in the government, even if uh, that means, yeah, so that, that might mean actually disobeying certain people in the government to actually fulfill Romans 13, right? And if, uh, if a, say, just in theory, that, the, uh, that certain people in the American government were trying to uh, overthrow the Constitution and, and establish a new regime, you would actually be disobeying Romans 13 by obeying them. So that's uh, something to think about. Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> what are we doing? Oh, yes. God's word on stewardship. Okay. So this is uh, continuing on from last week. <sighs> I keep forgetting next week is uh, Stewardship Sunday. <clears throat> I don't think I'm even going to preach on Stewardship Sunday next week. Uh, on stewardship. And we're, we're going to be done with this today. So, um, please tell all your friends, the only thing we're doing for stewardship next week is turning in the pledge cards. So, this is my scheme to, uh, not, yeah, yeah, I, I'm always scheming. Um, uh, this is my scheme to get people to not miss church because it's Stewardship Sunday. Is I'm not even going to talk about stewardship on Stewardship Sunday. I'm talking about it the two weeks before. <laughs> Um, and I've preached on it all year, so I don't have to preach on it tomorrow or, or next week. Um, so we're, we're finishing up what God's word says about stewardship. And last week we covered in your handout, um, first of all, just as a very quick review, i will try and go quickly through this, that our stewardship has to be based on scripture alone. That we talk a lot about budgets and we talk a lot about statistics and we talk a lot about the needs of the church and all of that is fine, but at the end of the day, 
we can't base what we give only on what we think we need to give or on what we think the church needs or on what we think other people will give or anything else. We have to base our giving on what the Bible says we should do because we have to base our entire Christian lives, stewardship being a small part of that, on what the Bible says we should do. And so um, a lot of things might work as far as stewardship goes, uh, but that doesn't really matter. What we need to do is look at what the Word says, and then we should consider our giving based on that. And uh, initial caveat, as I said last week, I'm sure that I'm talking about money specifically, and the pledge cards are about money specifically, because that's really what we need to work on as far as stewardship goes in this church and in our context right now. But when you think about stewardship, you should always think about it really as whole life stewardship, that God has given us an abundance of many gifts, our bodies, our families, our time, our talents, our uh, treasures, both monetary and physical treasures, all sorts of things God has given us that we are called to manage in this life. And it belongs to him first, but then we're called to manage it. Um, and then he shows us in his word how best to manage these things. But money is something specifically that his word talks about in terms of stewardship. And it's something that we do have to reckon with as we attempt to be at church together. Um, and it's, it is also very important for the revitalization as we've talked about. So um, that's what we're talking about specifically. Always keep in mind, this can be applied. The, the theories, the um, words can be applied to any part of stewardship in your life. Okay. And we started off, how much does God love me? Uh, he loves me so much that he sent his only son to die and to rise again, to forgive me of all my sins. And if he loves me that much, then anything he says to me in his word about stewardship is not going to be for my harm. Right? How There, there can be no phys, uh, poison in the cup your physician sends you. So, always keep that in mind first. And then the uh, part one of stewardship, the very first thing to recognize about stewardship, we already said, who does my money belong to? Psalm 24, 1, probably the clearest verse there. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everything belongs to God. He created it. Psalm 50 is another great one. I don't think it's listed there. Uh, the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. Why would I need your sacrifice right god already has everything that he needs so it already belongs to him the question is uh what has he given us to do with it and then we looked and we left off with this last time what jesus says about the stewardship of god's gifts and that goes into the second part of stewardship which is okay it belongs to god but then he's given it to me to steward. And so how do I actually make those decisions? What's going to be my presuppositions for thinking about these things? And we talked a little bit about um, investing. So uh, in Luke 16, 10 to 13, there, that's after the parable of the unjust steward, that um, you have to be trustworthy and handling the wealth that is given you. We also talked about the parable of the talents, that uh, we are called to actually make decisions and to invest what God has given us uh, for the, the growth and good of the church. And then uh, Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, where your treasure is there your heart will be also. So uh, the choir had left at that verse uh, last time, but the idea there, very simple, you can't pull a U-Haul behind the hearse, right? <laughs> you just can't. And I've been at many deathbeds before, and people never want to know what's in their bank account, right? People want to know, uh, 
where their family is. They do want to know that their family is going to be taken care of, but that really doesn't have to do so much with money. It has to do with the people that are there, right? And who's going to be there to make sure they're taken care of. Um, they want to pray. They want to receive the Lord's Supper, and they want to depart in peace. That's what people want when they die. And so uh, we all know that's coming, right? We all know that one day we're not going to be able to um, spend the money that we save up anymore. And so, uh, where do we store up treasures for ourselves in heaven? Well, the first place I think that we store them up is in church, right? This is week in, week out, where we receive God's gifts, where we uh, receive his word, and where we come to thank and praise and serve him in his house. And so, uh, the play, one of the places to store up treasures, to invest, um, as we talked about with like the parable of the talents or the unjust steward, is in the church. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of pick that theme back up as we keep going. All right, so that, that brings us uh, to where we left off. With what heart should I give my tithes and offerings? Second Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. The point is this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work. Alright, so, sowing and reaping. Uh, this is kind of the paradox of the Christian life. It also goes back to the parable of the talents, is that the mindset of the world is hide away, save, uh, keep, and even if it's investing, it's always um, kind of investing uh, so that I can store up more for myself. Right? Another great parable is the um, parable of the um, the wit the what what's it normally called the wicked manager maybe uh, the guy who stores up grain for himself in barns. He's so rich and he thinks. Um, Oh, I have so much that I don't know what to do with. I'm just going to keep building for myself bigger storehouses. And then that very night, his life is required of him. <coughs> Excuse me. The, that's the mindset of the world, right? Um, to, uh, even if we earn more and more to keep storing away for ourselves and never letting anyone else have anything of it. Um, and we think, you know, the more I have, and it's, this, it's really a first commandment issue. That thinking that we can provide for ourselves. Now, the, the paradox in the Christian life is that the more you give, the more you sow, and that doesn't, I'm not, it doesn't have to be money exactly. I mean, obviously that's what Paul's talking about. God loves a cheerful giver. But um, this has to do with all sorts of things, right? Kindness. The more you sow kindness, uh, the more uh, kindness will be, and this isn't supposed to be a, um, what's the Eastern philosophy of, you know, uh, karma? That's what it's this, isn't, this isn't karma exactly, although you could say there is a sense where it's kind of like the way that people talk about karma, but the, the more that you are willing to be kind to others and to show grace to others, uh, the more you will see grace in your own life. And that's not um, again, that's not kind of karma like it's kind of some sort of like magical thing that if you if you put this energy out in the world, the world's going to give this energy back to you. Uh, no, this is by the providence of God's hand that this occurs. Um, but when you sow, you will reap back, right? Um, and uh, this is this is also how God interacts with us. That God sows to us His mercy. And then uh, he reaps our thanksgivings to him, right? And so the same thing goes with our money, that when we sow bountifully, it is amazing what God can bountifully give back to us, right? And if, if you just think about this on a practical level with the church too, uh, when you sow bountifully, think about all the opportunities that the church that the church then has because it doesn't have to worry about do we have enough money for this 
project, do we have enough money for that project? Um, we're able to do a lot of great things uh, for the kingdom of God. And notice Paul there also is clear to include that when with this sowing and reaping, uh, there's always going to be God's provision there, right, in the background. You don't have to worry about giving too much or that there's not going to be enough for you when you give, uh, if you give too much away or something like that, because he is able to provide every blessing in abundance so that you always have enough of everything, and then you may provide sowing and reaping in abundance for every good work. Uh, so there's that. I mean, I do, I do think it is possible for someone to give too much to the church, although I think it rarely happens in our day. Right? I, I mean, it might be possible uh, that, that someone, if, if someone is really struggling to put food on their table because they're giving so much to the church and their budget, other than that, is already trimmed, you know, super lean, then sure, they, they might be giving too much to the church. Um, I don't think that happens that much in our society today. I think I, I gave this statistic last week that. Um, Average giving across the U.S. and American churches today, Christian churches, is about 2%. Average giving during the Great Depression was like 5%. So we give less now than people gave during the Great Depression. So um, that, that should really show you something about where most Christians' hearts are with giving. All right, what priority should my tithes and offerings have? Proverbs 3, 9 to 10, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first part of everything your land produces, then you will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with the finest wine. So this is something um, that I think is part of our kind of mindset, our heart about giving that is important is that I think a lot of people, when they consider giving to the church, it's an afterthought. I don't think a lot of people are opposed to giving to the church. It's not like, oh, the church is a, not a worthwhile cause to give to. There's probably some people who think that. Um, but I think a lot of people think, yeah, church, the church needs money, of course. Um, if they're a Christian, you know, yeah, we want to support the ministry of the church. We want to support the pastor. We want to support, uh, you know, being able to afford wine for communion or whatever. But, uh, you know, it's just not going to fit in the budget this month, right? It's kind of an afterthought. And what Solomon is saying here is that if you have your budget, right, you got all your wine items on your budget, the first one should be tied, right? It shouldn't be down here after everything else. Right now, how much you tithe, what percentage you tithe, um, we can talk about 10% more later if you want. I've talked about that before. That I think 10% is the basic starting point for Christians. Uh, that the the Old Testament teaches 10%. That's obviously not a law in the New Testament, but normally with these things that aren't laws in the New Testament, but are laws in the Old covenant, normally what happens in the New Testament is that they increase, not decrease, right? So um, the, the New Testament Christians, yes, the Sabbath day is not a law anymore, so they start worshiping on Sunday, but they actually start worshiping multiple times a week instead of one time a week, right? So um, I think 10% is a pretty normal starting point for most, most Christians, but regardless of the percentage, <laughs> It should be the first thing that you consider, right? So the first, this is the idea of first fruits. That the tithe, um, what went to the church, what went to the priest, that was always the first fruits of giving, right? Because you give your best to God. And this goes back to not just before kind of monetary, you know, money. Um, if you're talking about like what you produce, your harvest, right? The first fruits are the best um, of the harvest. Uh, you get the... You know, the, the, not the stuff that's kind of at the end of the season, stuff's kind of turning brown, there's a few good tomatoes here and there, but most of them are cracked. You know, you don't give that to the church, you give the stuff that's good, so it goes at the top of your budget. All right.
How often should I make my tithes and offerings? Um, on the first day of each every week, each of you should set aside some amount of money in relation to what you have earned and save it for this offering. 1 Corinthians 16.22. Okay, so or 6, 16.2. Um, there's a lot of things in this verse. First of all, notice this is a New Testament verse, and Paul is encouraging that you have a percentage, right? So it's proportional in relation to what you have earned. And then the question is, what percentage? And like we just were talking about, um, well, if you're going to look at the Bible, kind of what percentage would be normal for a Christian? I think 10% would be normal. It doesn't have to be exactly 10%. could be more, could be less. Uh, that's what you have to determine according to these words that we're all, that we're talking about. Um, and that it should be, so it should be proportional and it should be, to the question, weekly, right? Every Lord's Day, that's every week. On every Lord's Day, it's every Sunday. Uh, set aside some amount of money. And so I do uh, think this is good. Um, you, could, you could give monthly if you really wanted to. Um, but I think weekly is, is even better. And the pledge cards uh, are designed so that you consider things weekly, right? Um, and that's on the basis of, of this verse. So that you consider, okay, how much, if you break down your, your budget, if you break down your income uh, to weekly income, then what, what is the percentage of that that you want to give? Um, Deuteronomy uh, 16, each of you must bring a gift in proportion uh, to the way your God has blessed you. So that is just where Paul is getting that from in Deuteronomy. Um, and I think we'll skip Mark 12 there. I think that uh, Mark 12 is the story of the poor widow who comes in and brings two small copper coins. And um, Jesus blesses her for uh, giving out of her poverty. And this, this, is a, this is another reason why I think that I don't think normally people give too much. Um, while it might be possible theoretically, uh, we see here that even the poor widow gives this proportion of her money. And um, in fact, it's 100% of what she has to live on because she trusts so much that God's going to provide for her, right? And this is, uh, this is always a good thing to point out, too. In Acts 2, um, when the New Testament church is getting started, what's the, what's the tithe that everyone gives? Does anyone know in Acts 2? Take a guess. Give me a percentage. What percentage do you think everyone gives? Everyone gives it 100%, right? They went from 10% in the Old Testament to 100% at the beginning of the New Testament church. So the, the verse there is um, that they gave everything to the... Uh, uh, I'll just read it for you. So they were, were they all kind of living together? Yeah, it was a communal living situation in some sense um, as, a, as a community. So I'm not I'm not suggesting that you give a hundred percent. I'm just saying that it has happened in church history and they've been fine. <laughs> um, is we'll start at verse uh, forty-two because this is always a good verse. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is their preaching and fellowship. That's the gathering together of the church on the Lord's day. And the breaking of the bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. That's the divine service, folks. That's church on Sunday. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and, here's your verse, had all things in common. Had all things in common, We're talking about their, their possessions. Everything was everyone's and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. As anyone had need, right? So, the I don't want to be your money manager, but um, at the beginning of the New Testament church, all the money of everyone went to a pot, and they all lived on it together. When anyone had a need, and they helped take care of the poor, and they helped take care of each other. So, 
Um, we still have uh, remnants of that in our church, no doubt. We have the Elders Fund. We have Pastoral Discretion Fund. We have the Alms Fund um, so that we can help people in need. And uh, people give to those things, and that's all good. But uh, just remember when you're thinking about this proportional giving um, and the whole 10% thing, 10% uh, is really not that bad when you think about the fact that Christians have given 100% before, like the woman um, who gave out of her poverty. And we'll, we'll kind of continue with talking about this a little bit here. What, with what proportion of my income is God calling me to give? 2 Corinthians 8. Now I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done for the churches in Macedonia. Though they have been going through much trouble and hard times, their wonderful joy and deep poverty have overflowed in rich generosity. So again, here we have an instance where people who don't have a lot still give plenty. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did, they did it of their own free will. But just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge and complete earnestness and in love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. This grace of giving. So notice one of the overtones of Paul when he talks about these things is that uh, this giving, while he's... While he's saying it should be proportional and it should be generous, it should also be free and cheerful. Free and cheerful. Um, and I think that this, is, this can kind of be a hard thing because on one hand it's like, okay, we're going through this God's word and it can kind of be convicting and uh, I need to... You know, make sure that I'm giving them a, and, and when we talk about proportion, it seems it seems kind of legalistic or whatever. But I think when you uh, the the way to think about this is that this goes back to the very first question: How much does God love me? God loves me so much uh, that He gave His only Son for me. Okay, and if God loves me, then and I believe that, then I am a slave of Christ. And I want to follow his word. And if I am his slave and I want to follow him, and his word uh, shows me that I should be a generous, proportional giver, then it is a joy for me to give. It's a joy for me to give. And I would say this, I think, maybe I shouldn't say this, that if you're not joyful when you give, then don't give. If you're not joyful when you give, then don't give. Um, maybe that's shooting myself in, in my foot. I don't know. Maybe our clutch front's going to go down now. But um, I, th I think that it's true. Uh, so, so I give uh, online, which I, I highly suggest. I'm, okay. Remind me to talk for one minute about giving online here in a second. Um, and every time I get the email, you know, once a week, it's normally on Tuesday, I think, and I check my email in the morning after I say a prayer and turn on my phone. I'm not, like, sometimes I'm like, okay, that, you know, that went through. Uh, that, you know, good, good to know that there's that much less money in my bank account right now or whatever. Um, but I'm never really, like, upset about it. Right? I'm never like, you know, I was upset when I saw how much my electric bill was this month. <laughs> but, um, you know, even though it's a significant amount every week, I, I'm, I'm not upset about it because I know it's going to something that is worth it, right? 
and I know that I'm following God's word and that there can be no poison in the cup my physician sends me. If he's taught me this by scripture, he's going to provide for me. It's going to be okay. Right? So um, I think that you will be joyful when you give. Right? I think if you, if you decide what you're going to give on the basis of God's word and you give that much, then you will have joy in that. You will, you will say, you will, it might kind of hurt at first, but then it'll, it'll, you'll say, well, no, you know, I'm doing the right thing. It's, it's the same thing with anything where you follow your conscience, right? Um, there can be things that are difficult, right? The example I give as a pastor is I, I don't like calling the delinquents, right? I don't like calling people and saying, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. You really need to get back to church. You know, it's not. Like, it's not like I'm staring at my list, list at the beginning of every week and I'm like, oh yeah, I can't wait to call people and tell them that I think they're not doing the right thing with their life. You know, that just sounds like so much fun. Um, but if I don't do it, then I feel bad, right? Then I know I haven't fulfilled my job, I haven't done my duty, and then if I uh, do it and I do my job, even if it's not the most enjoyable thing ever, then I'm at peace, right? Because I've done what I've been given to do. And I know that I'm doing the right thing, even though it's not necessarily like the most uh, enjoyable. enjoyable thing according to worldly passion and worldly love. Right, so the same thing goes with the giving. That when you give, uh, the 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 joy of of having a clear conscience uh, is better than any other joy you can really have. Um, all right. So uh, in summary, uh, we already talked about the pledge card not being a requirement last week, but that considering these things is a requirement. So you might as well do the pledge card anyway. Um, but in summary. Uh, we are to give willingly, first priority, regularly, proportionately, and generously. And you can see that in all those verses there, I think. Um, so hopefully you've been able to see that. The What I said I want to talk about in, to finish up is online giving. Um, so <clears throat> if you fill out a pledge card and you dedicate yourself to giving a certain amount every week, the easiest way to make sure you do that which I highly, highly support and encourage, is to set up um, regular online giving. So you go to Beautiful Savior Lutheran dot org. Slash give. And if you want to uh, have the best deal for your giving, you click the one that says Banco No Fee, uh, and you type in your bank account information, which is your, your routing and your, your account number, and you set it for weekly giving, you make an account on Banco, you set it for weekly giving, and you put in the amount that you put on your pledge card. It's the easiest way to do it. If you want to give with a credit card or with a debit card, um, there is a fee that you can choose to cover or not cover. If you don't cover it, the church has to cover it. So I, I rather, I have it set to where um, people, the default is that whoever puts in the gift would cover it themselves. Uh, but if you really want to give with a card and you really don't want to pay the processing fee, then the church will cover it. But, um, you can, you can give by card as well with uh, Tithely. It's called Tithely, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y. Um, and there's a link on the website for that as well. So you can even, either give with the card or your bank account. The bank account is no fee. You just have to set up an account and um, put in your, you just have to have your account and routing number for your checking account. That's easier, uh, I think, because there's no fee and then it just, 
It's just like, it's just like you know, the, the government takes so much out of your social security, out of your paycheck, you know. Uh, just imagine it like that, you know. Every week you get a little bit taken out of your, your paycheck for tithing, and then it's number one on the priority list, and it's all taken care of. So I, I highly encourage that. Um, if you don't like online giving because you like to put the thing in the plate as it passes by, there are, and I need to announce this this morning because I, I, I've been meaning to announce this for like a year and I keep forgetting. At the entrance of the church, there are little I give online cards. You can take those, I can print as many as you want, and you can put one of those in the offering plate each week. Um, if, if that makes you feel better, to put something in the offering plate each week. But it is better for the church and it is better for you to not have to remember to write a check every week, right? Um, just have it withdrawn from the bank account automatically. Then you don't have to worry about it. All right, any questions on that, Steve? Uh, I had uh, better luck using a PC rather than your cell phone to sign up for Banco. Okay. So that's just a suggestion. You can try it with your phone, but I couldn't get it to work. So. Okay, good to know. If you sign up for Banco, just do it on the computer, not on your phone. Um, but tell all your friends to give online. It's the best, it's the better way to give. All right, let's uh, close with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a good manager for us, for giving from your fatherly hand to your creation every good gift that comes down from above. We pray that you would strengthen us to be stewards who wisely, who generously use your gifts that you have given us for the good of the church, for the love of you, and for the love of our neighbor. We pray that you would bless us today in spirit and in truth as we come to worship you. We pray that you would open the hearts and minds of all who are here today to hear your word, to worship you, and to love the appearing of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, lo who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.